Hello, Susan. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Hi, thank you for having me. Well, I am so excited. I feel like I should have met you a while back already, and somehow our paths have never crossed in person, but your name comes up regularly in all the good ways, and I'm very <laughs> excited to chat with you today. As does yours, and so am I. <laughs> awesome. So you have, I feel like you have the kind of job, and you maybe you get this a lot. I feel like I get this in event planning sometimes too, where you're in PR, you're a publicist, you're doing all the things. And I feel like sometimes that's maybe, you can correct me if I'm wrong, a job that can be like misunderstood. <laughs> Not necessarily understanding like, oh, it's like someone being like, I'm a consultant. And they're like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true, actually. Um, so if, if people, often I get asked the question, oh, what kind of books do you put out? Because they right. think I'm a publisher. Right. And I'm a publicist, which is very is different. Yes. yes. So what I, what I do as a publicist, I help my clients, which is mostly artists, but I do work with some creative entrepreneurs, be very intentional about how they're communicating who they are, what they're about, what their project is about. And most of my communications are directed towards media. I'm trying to get people interviews on podcasts like this, <laughs> on TV. I just, I'm very excited today. I just landed a, a full artist interview with the Winnipeg Free Press for one of my clients. Yeah, so that's really what my work is. It's trying to get like when I'm doing a really good job, you never see my name, hear my name. I have mm -hmm. no I get no credit. <laughs> except, <laughs> except I do have some very generous clients who often appreciate or recognize me at a live show, or tag me on uh, social media. I'll never forget uh, when Rosie and the Riveters, they made a meme and remember that saying, I've got 99 problems, but a blank ain't one. <laughs> and that's what they said. We got 99 problems, but a publicist ain't one. <laughs> but Susan's handling all the problems. Yeah, yeah and they tagged they tag me. So that was I sweet. love that. So when you're talking artists, you're talking musicians, you're talking artists in a sense of, I know we were talking about our mutual friend, Denise Klett. You're talking yeah. about people that are actual like painters, artists, yeah. musicians, Actual all artists. the things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've worked with dancers. I've worked with the jazz festival. I'm just negotiating a contract for a television show to be their publicist. Uh, yeah. Mostly in the arts that way, mm -hmm. mostly music so far, but uh, yeah. So, and then some creative entrepreneurs I've helped when um, the 220 in Saskatoon, mm -hmm. when it had with the grand opening, gosh, when was that? over 10 years ago. Oh my and goodness. I, uh, I helped them plan the grand opening and it was a big party, all the yeah. media. We did a, we did a, an actual press event, which was exciting. So I helped sort of strategize how that should go. What was the purpose? Invited all the right people, not always media, sometimes it's industry people. Yeah. So when I'm doing outreach for my clients for music, I'm reaching out to the industry associations, mm -hmm. the the people that might hire them to do shows, things like that. So it's all about sort of elevating a client's um, public reputation. Well, and I love that because I feel like with artists um, and creative entrepreneurs, anybody who is trying to self-promote in some way. So whether you are a solopreneur, which I am, I'm in my yeah. own business, there's always this level, I was just actually talking to a friend about that this week, there's always this level of, it's not even that you're not confident about what it is that you're doing, but it's very different having somebody mm. say things about you and your business oh, than to very. feel like you're like, hey, you know, like all of us, I mean, maybe it's the Saskatchewan in us too, where we're like, we don't want to be tooting our own horn and like, saying all the things about ourselves, even if we are really confident about the things yeah. that we can do, it just feels weird, right? So to have somebody like you who is able to, like you said, elevate that and be able to speak to what you know of this company and be the voice without having to be in the group or being the artist themselves, that's a very, very big gift for a company to be able to have. Thanks. Yeah, it, it is. And it is very hard to toot your own horn. Say, hey, look at me. Look at this amazing thing I'm doing. I hear it all the time from artists. So glad. It feels so good for them. 
to have someone like me promoting them, but also they kind of like saying, this is my publicist. Susan. Yeah. <laughs> I know, it's, like a, it's like, yeah, we've, we're kind of a big deal. We've arrived. Here's, here's my publicist. She'll handle it. I know that feels yeah. good rolling off the tongue. I could handle that. <laughs> <laughs> See, <laughs> I like it. So how did you decide? Cause I mean, publicists can be used for variety of reasons and industries and things like I could see and in every industry in the world needing a publicist for certain aspects of life and business but how did you make the decision to niche your PR business into the arts and creatives type of um area because I feel like it mm. would be hard this is something we talk about a lot on the podcast especially in the world of entrepreneurs and owning your own business, it's really hard sometimes to not want to just say yes to all the things. And then you get overwhelmed and then you're like, oh, right. I really need to niche down. I need to niche down. This is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, wait a second. I said, I wasn't going to do those things anymore. And now I'm back doing the things I said I wasn't going to do. And I feel like there's this ebb and a flow sometimes that happens with that. So how did you decide that this particular creative art industry was where you wanted to really focus on with your PR services. So that's a bit of a longer story. I think you want to hear it, right? We need to do, we all have to do like multiple parts, hey? <laughs> <laughs> but first of all, I will say not many people call themselves a publicist anymore. You won't mm -hmm. find many people that identify as a publicist. It is pretty niche. Usually people are marketing, you know, public, publicity uh -huh. is part of marketing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And usually it's all sort of packaged together right now, which kind of makes someone that says they do marketing, what does that really mean? There's so right. many parts of marketing. There's visual, there's graphic design, there's writing, there's pub publicity, which is, I mostly think about as media. Uh, there's, gosh, what else? There's a videography, there's social media. There's- You're right, marketing is almost sales. like- it's almost like marketing is turning into that like consultant reference I just said. You're like, oh, yes. I, I can't quite identify what it is that I do. I'm in marketing. <laughs> so I have really put a, a square around what I do. And I say, yeah. this, I, this is what I do, this is what I don't do. But backing it up, how I got into publicity for the arts, you know, as a child, I love the arts. I used to play the piano. I used to, my best friend and I used to make up routines on our trampoline set to oh, music and would put up signs. We would sell tickets for 10 cents that nobody showed it. up to, but we still put the show on. <laughs> I think our, one show of our moms go came. On. <laughs> <laughs> so I always did things like that. However, I had a sort of <laughs> my arts, the arts in my life really went dark for about 10 or 12 years, like in theater terms, right? Uh, after I finished university, I mean, I even played in the concert band in university, I played the clarinet. But after that, I sort of just went into work. I didn't have the benefit of being in a small town and being involved in everything there was. And I did not appreciate how much I love the arts. But about close to 30 years old, I think, I really started having a gaping, dark hole in my career world because I studied finance. And I actually worked in finance, but something was really, really missing. So I did a bunch of career counseling and you know what came up at the top of my interests, the arts. And I remember the career counselor asking me, so tell me, do you sing? Do you dance? Do you act? What do you do? And I burst into tears. I was like, nothing. <laughs> and I didn't know any people in the arts. Like I had no, you know, tribe yeah. of my, my people. So I realized, oh my I need to do something about this. So I signed up for a songwriting class. I, I called my old agent again because I briefly did some modeling when I was about 18. Called her again. I'm like, I'm going to try acting. I'm going to try singing. I'm going to take singing lessons, took makeup classes, just like dove in. All my extra time was taking classes. And I auditioned and got a part in a country music video that was on for CMT I love it. I love it. <laughs> with a local film production company called Fahrenheit Films. So Tony Rinchuk, I auditioned for him through my agent, got the part, went on set. And I was just, you know, my whole soul lit up. I was like, this is amazing. What? And I asked him for coffee, like, tell me about your life. How do you be a film director? What does that even mean? Because I grew up in a small town, no exposure to anything like this. So I, I guess it was, wasn't very long after that, that he, through his company, put up a posting for looking for an intern to work for free evenings and weekends on his film productions. Like, yep, sign me up. 
but very shortly that turned into paid work. And I got to go to Nashville with him within about six months and be, do some producer, uh, you know, tasks, roles on a full out uh, country music documentary about someone premiering at the Grand Ole Opry, Shane Yellowbird to be specific. Wow. So we, we were backstage at the Opry. I'm standing beside Vince Gill. I'm like having a real moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and through working with Tony, doing music videos for larger bands like 10 years ago, Doc Walker, Jason Blaine. Yes. I, one of the things he tasked me with, and I didn't know it was publicity, but he asked me, Susan, will you write a press release? Will you send it right. to the CTV and CBC and Global and try to get us some interviews for these bands? And then some of the artists said, hey, you're really good at that. Do you do bios? Do you, I, you know, would you help me promote my show or my tour, my new album? I thought, oh, interesting. And I was trying to explore, what do I want to do in the music industry? I was reading books about music management, all the different jobs you could, I was really toying with that. Should I become a music manager? And I was asking people, what do you think? And do you know Megan Kardash, Sneakers and Lipstick? Yes. Okay, so we were on set together at a music video. She was a wardrobe stylist. I was, the, uh, well, I guess I was just a production assistant. But I said, uh, Megan, what do you think I would be good at? Because <laughs> she was in a band too. She knew a lot more about this. She was in Violent Kin at the time. She goes, I think you'd be a good publicist. I'm like, hmm, interesting. Because that's what was kind of popping up. Yeah. And then so uh, Carrie Catherine. Yes. Oh, she's just Carrie the loveliest. Catherine, I bumped into Carrie Catherine and we were chit-chatting and she said, what are you doing? And I have a belief. If you are doing something at all and you want to do more about more of it, you need to talk about it and tell people that you do it. Oh my gosh. We're just going to press pause so... right here because <laughs> this is the motto of my entire life. And I feel like that, what you just said comes up in almost every single podcast episode really? because I fully believe that too. And you, if you don't believe it, then you maybe haven't tried it yet because it is unbelievable, but there's really, it's like such a basic concept. It's such a basic concept, but I think with all of this, how in the last sort of number of years, there's just been a lot more focus on, um, being okay with being more vulnerable and sharing things about your life and talking about things. Cause I think we used to hold a lot of it in because if it didn't happen, then we were shameful. Then we yes. were embarrassed. Like I put it out there and said, Oh, I was going to do this. And then it didn't happen in the time frame that I thought it should happen in. And then everyone around me thinks that I'm a failure because I said this was going to happen. Then it didn't, whatever the story is we're telling ourselves. And I fully agree. I'm like, so it didn't happen. Okay, that's fine. Moving on to the next thing. Like if you want it to happen and every single day of the week, there's these crazy connections that happen <laughs> when you say something and put it out there. Yeah, it's wild. So I bumped right? into Carrie and she said, what's new, Susan? Come oh, I said, on. I'm doing a little bit of publicity. That's what I oh. said. I'm doing a little bit of publicity. She's like, no way. I am working on my grant application for my album release <gasps> tour right now. And I would love to work with someone local. Can we have a meeting? And I was like, yes. But I was uh. like, I don't know what I'm doing. But I said, yes, we had a meeting before the meeting. I went, marched myself down to McNally Robinson because this was also like 2011, right? And I bought <laughs> public relations for dummies. <laughs> and I, took it. I, I love, love that that's a part of your story. <laughs> that is fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> but you do what you got to do. Yeah. And I've done so much more, of course, to learn of course so much yeah. in the industry but that was I, I like to tell people that because I really I just knew I could figure it out <laughs> well and you know what that's sort of part of the whole thing right like if you are passionate about something you're driven about something you I feel like most of us who have that type of gumption also don't want to fail we don't want to let people down around us so when we've committed to something we're like come hell or high water this is getting figured out whether I actually know what I'm doing or whether I'm faking it till I make it, it really doesn't matter because it's going to be fabulous. I yeah. can promise you that. <laughs> I agree. And I have to say, I started saying this, the phrase, I'm a publicist well before mm -hmm. I felt confident in saying it, but the more I said it, the long, and the more I did it, it now it feels very, you know, very comfortable to say, yeah, I'm a publicist. Yeah. 
but at first it really didn't. So I guess that's a message for anyone. Uh, it's okay if it doesn't quite fit yet, try it on. Well, and it's almost the same, on. like saying what you are is almost a similar concept as saying what you want to be doing, right? Like you're exactly, you're just making that be the truth of what's going on. And I mean, whether you've worked with one person doing some publicity work, you've technically been a publicist then, mm -hmm. right? Like even if you've only done one project, yep. you've technically done it. And now we can start naming it if that's what you want to do. I like that. That's a good little nugget to take away from here today. Thank you. Um, so what would you say then? So then as you've been building your career and um, living into what you never knew you always wanted to do, um, how then do you actually work with clients? So you mentioned like a client will reach out to you or you bump into them on the street, whatever the case may be, but they reach out to you and do they generally have an idea of what it is they want you to do for them? Or is it, oh my goodness, we really want to grow. I want to grow as an artist, but I don't actually know how. Hmm. Help. I like to work with artists who know what they want. Hmm. It's in my intake form on my website. Uh, the question, I can't remember exactly how I word it, but what would be a home run for you? Hmm. Like how, what, what would it look like to hit the bullseye with a publicity campaign because I'm hesitant to work with people that don't really know what they're trying to do yeah yeah, yeah I've, no, I've kind of tried that and it's <laughs> not my favorite experiences right, my favorite are a... people that do know what they want and they might not know exactly what the publicity aim is but usually they do Kimberly because otherwise people that are contacting me saying what does a publicist even do they're right. probably not ready for me right well, and it's interesting because I feel like what you're describing in any business, whether you are a creative, whether you are in some type of corporate industry, doesn't really matter what, what the business is. There is always, there is always things of that need to be worked on in your business and like working in your business and doing your business are two different things. And those are things that often it's hard to do at all. And when you are a solopreneur, like I am, or you are an artist who is just wanting to be an artist and wanting to play their music and paint their paintings and do their things, it's hard to, like any business, it's hard to kind of prioritize all mm -hmm. of the little itty bitty things that need to happen in a business from the marketing and the getting the exposure and yeah a website and like all of the things if you're just hidden in your basement playing music and painting like the world will never know what you're doing right so there's so many things that are hard to juggle at all and I feel like this is a lesson that I'm learning every single day, even though I've been self-employed for almost 20 years. Yeah. It's still a matter of doing what, doing the things that you're good at and letting other people do the things that don't need to be things that you're good at. Absolutely. That's bang on. They, and it's that's best hard. To find it's people hard that are really good. Find. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. It is. But you know what? I, um, I find myself doing a lot of education with artists. I'm part of the career tracks program through SAS Music, where I'm available. For, um, musicians who are part mm. of SAS Music can get one free session with me. And it's really like a one on one consultation. And I'm teaching a lot. And it's interesting. I find um, I'm teaching a lot that they really need to know what they want to accomplish and when and to strategize. And I think this is common for everybody because a lot of people contact me saying, we need to do publicity. We want to be in the papers, but why and when? Because right. if you have an album coming out next, okay, so it's June right now. So you didn't, you're planning to have an album come out next February, but you have something happening in September. If you get a, you know, a, a story, an interview in your big local daily newspaper now, they can't do one again for you in February. What do you really want? Do you want to promote that? Mm -hmm. If the album release is 15 times more important to you than the thing that's happening in September, don't pitch your story to the newspaper in September. It's about right. being really strategic, always leading up to what you're ultimately trying to accomplish. Oh my goodness. I love that. Well, and it really, 
it's hard to sometimes keep all of that in a row when yeah. you're just trying to do your business. Right. So yeah. I can 100% see, I feel like there's a lot of overlaps of what I'm hearing you say in a lot of the work that I've done as an event planner, where I'm not, a, would never call myself a publicist, but kind of coming up with the overall picture and making sure that the ducks are in a row and you're often planning it like at least a year in advance and mm -hmm. what's all happening in that year. And it's hard to kind of see the whole scope when you're so in your business. It's kind of nice to have that fresh perspective of somebody um, who's caring about your business and wanting the best for you, but not in the the day-to-day -day grind of what's going on. You can kind of see a little bit of a bird's eye view, clearer picture of um, what's happening. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I like to how, like how I work with my clients. It is a pretty personal relationship. We are going to interact a lot, mm -hmm. an awful lot, <laughs> phone, text, email. So we have to like each other. I have to like my client. I want them to yeah. like me too. I actually make friends with a lot of my clients. I do not have a no friends with your clients policy. It's the opposite. Totally. I actually only want to work with people who I'd like to be friends with mm -hmm. um, because I, I feel no distinction between personal life and business. I feel like this is my life. Yeah. Yes. And I, I want it to be fun and enjoyable. And I really try very hard to really understand my clients and what they're trying, what they want. So clarity around, you know, what you want, what you're trying to accomplish, what your specific goals are. It's really important, no matter who you're bringing into your team. Oh my goodness. I love that. I agree. And I think, I think sometimes that from the past, maybe there's this idea that there shouldn't maybe be this fluidity between your business and your life. And I have always felt that way too. And sometimes to the point of, okay, I maybe need to just rebalance things a little bit because they're going a little lopsided with like how much time is being spent in certain areas, but not the fact that they overlap. I have always mm. loved, that's been one of my favorite parts of owning a business is the fact that there gets to be this overlap in a way that works, not in a way where I'm dreading Monday morning. Not in a way where I'm like, oh, good, it's the weekend. Like, I don't even really notice these pieces because it's all happening all the time. And it feels just feels like this goodness. It doesn't feel like there has to be this cut and dry, like, oh, powering it down here. No one talked to me. I'm done now till Monday. You know, there's a time and place for relaxation, obviously. But you know what I mean? It just feels yeah. like this good this good place where, yeah, the clients that I work with are people that I enjoy their company. I enjoy their presence. I'm not wishing they weren't like, oh boy, they're calling me again. It doesn't ever feel like that. It just feels like good. I like that, that you said that. Me too. And I just thought of something, not to say there's no boundaries. There's a ton of boundaries. <laughs> boundaries I'm not, a, equal I'm not joy. available at any time. I, you know, I, but if you can know what you're willing to give and not give what you do yes. and don't do, it, it doesn't have to be messy. Like I've, I think I've learned a lot of lessons over the years and I don't feel sort of like any trauma or tr not trauma, drama, I guess, or turmoil around yeah. that. Whereas I, I did probably 10 years ago, I wanted to do this so bad. I would just do almost anything way beyond what I was paid for. And I don't do that anymore. Yeah. Well, and usually we have to learn the lessons in order to get there. And sometimes I feel like it's an ebb and a flow. I've been in like places where I feel really like, oh yeah, I got this nailed down. These boundaries, they're in there. Cause I feel like boundaries equal joy, joy. Boundaries do not equal rules and regulations. Boundaries mean that I am like confident in knowing what is acceptable and not acceptable for me. And it doesn't have to be the same for anybody else, but whatever works for me, is what allows me to feel that freedom and joy yeah, in my that's life. That's exactly what I was right? going to say when you were talking. I think boundaries equal freedom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think there's a bit of a misconception still that boundaries equal rules. No, Don't like you even think... when we first started this conversation, I told you I have an end time because I have another <laughs> meeting. Was there any, there was nothing, no problem about that. It was just open, honest. This is what I'm willing to give. Does that work for you? Well, and you yes. Know, okay. <laughs> yeah, totally. And you know what? I feel like it's funny like that too, because I feel like even in this podcast is actually a really good example of that. I feel like even when I'm like reaching out, I'm like, this is what is required needs to be like, this is how much time it will take. This is what it's going to be and totally fine if that doesn't work. Yes. But then oh, this won't work and that's, that's okay. A, what you just said is a great lesson actually for publicity because that's how I feel when I'm making pitches. 
Mm. I do. And I recommend that everybody sort of think about any kind of pitch this way is when you're putting out a request, like you sent to me, like I send to media every day, I'm very much okay if it doesn't work for them and no expectation and no hard feelings. And if they don't even respond to me, I don't take it personally either totally. because they're getting probably bombarded with pitches. And if it will actually make you feel a lot happier, if you can look at any sort of pitch or request that you send out, I'm speaking to the audience when I say you, yes, totally. <laughs> uh, if you can remove that sort of expectation, because really nobody owes you anything. And if you get a response, just say, yes, yes, I got a response. <laughs> yeah. Um, and not getting a response has nothing to do with you. That's right. And go ahead and follow up again. It is yeah. not necessarily a rejection. They might not have seen it. In fact, they probably didn't. Who knows? 17 different things could have happened that they missed your email. There was a technical glitch. It stuck in their junk mail. Uh, their dog got sick that day and they had to rush to the vet. They accidentally swiped on their phone and deleted it. I mean, don't take it personally. 100%. Well, I totally agree. And I feel like there is a lot of room, especially with the fact that we are able to contact and connect with people in 1.2 billion different ways right now in all of the messaging systems and all of the social media apps and all of the ways where there's like, feels like 500 places that you need to check if you have misplaced something where you're like, was that this contact? Did that, did that come in this way? Did it come in over here? Did that come in over there? You know, like whatever the case may be, but the, that almost leads to the, as making generous assumptions about people yeah. rather than jumping to the conclusion that I'm a failure. No one wants to talk <laughs> to me. They didn't reply to me. Like that's, I think the like human nature yeah. to fall to that, even when a hundred things have gone right in a day and one thing goes wrong, it takes every single ounce in me, even with the amount of personal development and therapy that I feel like I've done in my <laughs> many years of life to not want to focus on the negative. And I'm yeah. like, why is that? Like, it's just yeah. this interesting Something concept. About I, feel our like brains. I, I know. Yeah. The way and, our brain is I, wired. Yeah. Talking about this though, is another one of those things where like you talk about it and then we get to remove some of the stigma from it. We get to just talk about it and lay it out there. And it's okay to like have hurt feelings, but it's also okay to assume that people make mistakes and things fall through the cracks. And we're all just one human to another. I just thought of a question uh, my, my therapist asked me many years ago when I was jumping to a conclusion about what something meant. She's like, yes. what else could this mean? And we, we came up with a list of 15 other things that it could be. Yeah. So I, that's a good question to ask yourself. If you're jumping to a conclusion and freaking out, stop. Yes. What else, what else could this mean? Oh, oh, I love that. Well, that's a good reminder for myself. I love that. Um, so I can only imagine that over the years of your career that you have had so many interesting interactions with these amazing artists and creative entrepreneurs and everything in between that you have had the pleasure of being able to do um, PR work for. Mm -hmm. um, what have been like one, a couple just amazing experiences. I know you're talking about being in the back of the Grand Ole Opry. I'm like visualizing. I was in Nashville last year. Well, I guess I don't say, I feel like I've like eliminated 2020. So when I say last year, I'm like, when we could travel. Um, <laughs> but being in the Grand Ole Opry. That was a was magic stage, of course. But like just being in the audience and being there and just experiencing this like, it's like a palpable, heart pounding energy. Yes. in the room and like Darius Rucker was hosting and there was lots of people there that night. It was like a stacked lineup of people Well, the night we were there. And I'm like, this feels like you're a part of some sort of like historical mm -hmm. moment in here that these walls have heard and seen so much greatness that it just was like almost like a little bit of an out-of-body experience being yeah. in there because it was so magical. It really is. Were you at the Ryman? I was at the Ryman. Yeah. And I had, you will appreciate this in your line of work. I had the wildest experience at uh, the Bluebird. Mm. While we were in Nashville, we went with some friends, my husband and I, and like, it's like a lottery to get into the Bluebird. You can't 
request to go. You just let the cards fall where they're going to fall. Right. We were lucky enough. There was eight of us that were traveling together. We were lucky enough to get four tickets. So we had to make the decision. And so the gentlemen in our lives let the ladies go to the Bluebird while they oh, went nice. to the season opener of the Predators. So they had lots of fun and they did their own thing while they were wishing that they were, but they graciously let us go. And we were at the Bluebird and didn't really know um, any of the artists that were there, but we were just so excited to like be in there and listen. And they were exceptional and we're in there. And all of a sudden, halfway through the evening, we're like just enjoying ourselves. Everything's good. When all of a sudden out of the blue, who walks in from the very back of the Bluebird, but Ed Sheeran himself. Wow. Singing because it was one of his songwriters that was one of the artists yeah. there um, for the evening, whom we didn't know of her. Right. Um, but she has written many of his songs. And he walks in and just joins in halfway through wow. while she's singing. And there was you could have heard a <laughs> pin drop. It was like audible gasps in the room, oh, but wow. nobody said a word. It was oh, like, you know, when you're at a concert and someone like surprises and comes in and it's like, whoa this crazy excitement this was like the opposite it was like this like eerie calm that everyone was like oh my gosh we're witnessing like something that hasn't maybe happened here before this feels awesome and it was so cool and as quickly as he entered he whisked off and it was it it was like it never happened it was so cool wow that's a very there's, there's cool my story. there's my Nashville wow moment <laughs> <laughs> oh well I've had so many I don't know where to where to start um but I can go into more at the you know that whole week we were in Nashville it was moment after moment after moment of meeting legends and I got to do you know, I was a producer so I got to do some research outreach I was writing interview questions and doing some interviews with the person in charge of the whole Grand Ole Opry and then we got to go backstage with little Jimmy Dickens now he was probably Tom passed. Holland. He was probably passed already when you were there. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But when we were there, which was, I think, 2009, actually, it was a while ago. He was still alive. He was still hosting in his cowboy outfit. Oh. If anybody, he was a, he was on the Opry for years and years and years. And he wore one of those rhinestone studded, you know, polyester cowboy suits. Yeah. So we got to go back into his dressing room and interview him. And I mean, and he's, he was not very tall. That's why he's called little Jimmy Dickens. He was such a character and such an honor and a legend to meet him. That was amazing. And then we went upstairs and then Shane was going to go on stage and we, we couldn't shoot. We weren't allowed to shoot or I, I didn't have anything to do because I wasn't a camera operator. I was a producer. So while some of the show was on and after Shane was done, I had some free time before we were going to pack up and leave. And I was backstage and I was like there's layers of curtains that you can stand between as people come onto the stage. Okay. And Vince Gill was going to go on and do a solo song. And I found this little pocket of between the curtains where I could sit backstage on a stool and I'm sitting behind Vince Gill, looking at him, looking out onto the whole audience, spotlights on him. And he's saying, unfortunately, he had a friend who had um, committed suicide just a few days before and he wrote a song for him he was and then he played the song oh just my God. Vince and his guitar acoustic and I'm sitting back there all by myself just having a real moment and I was like this is absolutely magic I can't believe I'm here uh, you know a year ago I prior to that I had nothing to do with any of this uh, it was just a real moment and I was like I love this so much yeah that was a special one and then with like on behalf of clients I get just as excited as they do whenever I land a big story mm -hmm. for them just recently um, my clients the North Sound from Saskatoon they're an indigenous duo Forrest and Nevada yes. they're life partners and musical partners uh, I got Forrest on CBCQ in the fall Yay. And he was, he was over the moon. I was over the moon. We were mutually over the moon. <laughs> it's so fun. Uh, so that was just a real thrill. Uh, I, I got Rosie and the Riveters onto eTalk in Toronto. 
So and I'll never neat. forget when I, yeah, I phoned and I spoke with Allison and I, I who's still a friend. Uh, and I said, Allison, sit down because you're not going to believe this. You guys are going to get interviewed on eTalk. And she screamed like I had to, <laughs> she screamed and she was screaming and jumping up and down. And then I was screaming and jumping up and down. <laughs> Oh my it's gosh. So I fun. Love that. Yeah. Like I really get, um, it's a personal real, you know, joy and a real hit, like a drug, almost like a high to get mm-hmm. these, these big hits that makes my clients so excited. Well, which is really speaks as a testament to how passionate you are about what you do, because I feel the same way when I'm like planning events and when I'm doing things for clients and it just, I think I like to put myself so far into their shoes of how I would want to be treated, how I would want somebody to do something for me and, and how excited I would want somebody to be if this was happening to me and all of the things. And I hear you saying that, and I hear the tone in your voice where I'm like, that is also such a huge gift about what you're able to do for these clients. Cause it's one thing to land things. Sure. That's fine. But to be passionate about it and to really genuinely care and scream on the phone and and jump up and down and like want to pop champagne because this happened, like that takes the whole, I don't want to call it customer service because that makes it sound like smaller than it is, but that takes the whole service piece of what you are doing uh, for your clients to another level. And you feel that energy. That's like, keeps people connected. And that's what makes somebody talk about, that's what makes somebody gives you a shout out on there (laughs) because they (laughs) feel that you're a part of the team after you've been so in depth with something so personal, really. And I really feel like that it doesn't matter what your job is. If you're an accountant, (laughs) if you're a a healthcare provider and someone has a win and they're all of a sudden now they're sleeping through the night and they couldn't sleep before, like it doesn't matter what you do. Uh, it actually makes life much more joyous to, to connect with your clients, your customers, your patients, whatever they are. You are speaking my language. That is for (laughs) sure. I could not agree more. So before we close, I feel like I could talk to you for forever. I have a few speed questions, which I always laugh because they really end up not always being really (laughs) speed questions because it turns into other conversation, but I love hearing fun details about, um, your life. So what book are you currently reading or listening to? Yes, I mostly listen, but I'm really deep into Dan Sullivan and strategic coach. The book is called procrastination priority. Ooh. I'm listening to it on repeat right now. Uh, Dan Sullivan is a business coach. He owns a company called Strategic Coach. And I just actually signed up for a year long program with them. And mm. it's all about uh, adjusting your mindsets, thinking bigger, also being more strategic with how you run your days. And this first concept is for the first time ever turning your mind around about the things you procrastinate about are not something to beat yourself up up about, but they are a signal system to show you what your priorities are for the next day, for the next week. Mm. And it's, it's actually a result of being an ambitious person. People that aren't ambitious don't procrastinate. They don't even feel like it's procrastinating. (laughs) They don't feel guilty that they're not doing the big thing. Right. It's actually a sign of ambition. It's actually a sign of you're growing. So it's, uh, I'm still re- listening on repeat because I'm still trying to absorb it all. Yeah. <laughs> but this is what I'm hearing so far is re- removing the guilt and using it as a tool to help you sort of make your plans for the next day, the next week, the next month. Well, I've written this one down because I <laughs> love book recommendations and this is right up my alley. Um, are you a coffee drinker? And what is your coffee order? Every single morning, I have a Bulletproof coffee, decaf Bulletproof, like Dave Asprey's brand. I've been drinking this for years. I love it. Uh, And it has, you put butter in it. You put, Mm -hmm. there's Bulletproof collagen protein powder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And blend it up in my Vitamix and it's beautiful latte. Every morning I have that. And then when I go to the coffee shop though, 
I don't have a regular order. I try something different all the time. Right now, I'm I usually and I usually be in, get inspiration from my friends what they're really digging. Uh, one of my friends introduced me to blended strawberry lemonades at Starbucks. So the last ten times I've been there, I ha it's basically an adult Slurpee. Yeah. <laughs> you can feel a little more classy. Are, my kids that. are absolutely <laughs> in love with those as well. It's a Slurpee. It's a Slurpee. Let's just it's say it. <laughs> Let's be honest. Sounds yeah, delicious. But I do though. try all, all kinds of different things at coffee shops. Yeah. I love that. You're the first person that has ever answered that question like that. Oh, you're unique. Um, what would you say right now, where you are at in your life would be the theme song of your life? Oh, <laughs> you told me you'd be asking me this. And gosh, you know, two things popped into my head. I have an earworm. I don't know if it's a theme song, but it's running in my head all the time because watermelon sugar is so big on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> is that my theme song I don't even know what it's about but it's in my head a lot <laughs> it's gotta mean something it's in your head running it's gotta mean something <laughs> and then I'll tell you oh this is a little secret not a secret but it's something private that I do but I'm going to share it when I need to get pumped up about something like say mm -hmm. I have a, a big pitch a big presentation a job interview you know me potentially meeting a new client or something outside of my comfort zone and I need to get in the zone zone yeah well, I was an athlete as a child and I really like pump up music. So I will play a little bit of ACDC. Are you ready? And I get ready <laughs> to slay. <laughs> I love it. And are we, are we jumping around? Are we like air guitaring? Mm, are we, I might do thing? a plank. I might do a okay. plank, <laughs> you know, really get the That's body going. Really lots, get it going. Lots Focus. of deep breathing. There might be some dancing. Uh, yeah. But that's those are I <laughs> love I love it well your secret is your secret is safe with me and my many many thousands of listeners <laughs> there you go that's okay um I love Try it. it it's a good one <laughs> okay Classic. you know what like a lot of things that I'm jotting down here because this is I'm gonna be listening to this episode over and over again just like you're listening <laughs> to your book um what is your favorite junk food oh chocolate chocolate everything chocolate anything chocolate ice cream chocolate covered pretzels chocolate bars <laughs> chocolate even cake brownies in common. <laughs> um, chocolate yeah i loud and clear no other comment needed i'm nope. in the same boat as you <laughs> um when was the last last time you really really laughed and what were you laughing about? Oh, almost every day because I have a dog and her name is Goldie and she is absolutely hilarious. She's a Havanese. She's sleeping beside me right now, but she is a real character. They're known actually, they've been used as circus dogs. They're, enter <gasps> they're entertainers. And she You're is living so with an funny. entertainer. Yeah, I wake up yeah. laughing. Yeah, she, she is always, she's just so cute and funny. And my gosh, I can't even think of one, but I know I had a belly laugh this morning in the first five minutes of being awake. <laughs> the best I know I ask that question because laughing is on the top top list of my favorite things to do I laugh constantly sometimes when I'm nervous I laugh sometimes yeah. I find things that shouldn't be funny funny I laugh like it's <laughs> just my thing and there have been times in my life where I felt very like insecure about that when I was younger because that was like just something that came natural to me and felt that there was times where I should maybe not be that way and have really owned into it as I've become an adult and growing up older and have owned it as mm -hmm. a gift because it really slices stress. It's oh, like the calm I love to laugh. I listen to comedy all the time. Actually, yeah. while I was making dinner, I was listening to a stand-up comedy special. So I was probably <laughs> belly laughing then too. Yeah. My sister and I, we have routines. Like when we answer the phone, we, we have some throwback, you know, scripts from movies from the nineties. Sometimes we'll answer the phone in character, things like oh that. My like, God. I think it's fun. Yeah. It's important to laugh. That could be a whole episode. <laughs> we just go back and forth in characters. I love it. Um, when we are, we are on the cusp of nearly being able to maybe mm. travel in a way that feels more usual than what we're used to and where are you most looking forward to going mm, Norway oh <gasps> Norway what's in Norway for you 
So my grandma was born there and lived there for the first four years of her life. She never went back. She passed years ago, but I have been just really feeling a craving to connect with my Scandinavian roots. So my grandmother was 100% Norwegian. My uh, maternal grandfather was Icelandic and English. So that's, I'm almost half because yeah. Icelanders are Norwegians that took the boat over to Iceland. Right, basically. right. <laughs> So I just finished watching the Viking series. I'm watching another Norwegian show in, Nor in Norwegian language with English subtitles called Ragnarok. I'm just really into Norwegian mythology. Just submersing Atlantic. yourself right in yeah, there. I just, I really feel, it's interesting. I'm working with a lot of clients who are exploring their own identity mm. uh, and their roots. I have uh, several Indigenous clients right now who didn't used to even identify or put that out there as part of their story. And now it very much is. Uh, my client and friend, Alexis Norman, who used to be in Rosie and the Riveters, but she's also a solo artist and she is Francesqua. So she's, that's Saskatchewan Francophone. Right, and yeah. she's very, she's working on multiple projects, a film project, musical projects, all deep about identity. And it's working with my friends and clients has really made me look at my own heritage and realize I have very little connection to it and so I'm, I'm really curious to deepen that and I want to go find where my grandma lived when she was a little girl I love that whole entire answer because <laughs> it wasn't a lightning I mean, round answer <laughs> well no and that's what I said beforehand I was like I call it a lightning round and I need to maybe find a cool catchier name for it yeah. that doesn't make it lightning round but it there, I love that because I think there's just this, I mean, especially after this past year and there's just been a lot of, I think, reflection and things that so many of us have just taken new and different things to heart and tried to open ourselves up to um, learning more, knowing more, understanding more um, about ourselves and about the people around us and about the cultures around us and about the world around us. And I just think that the more we spend time uh, knowing those things confidently about ourselves, the more open we are to people around us. And if we were all doing that more, we would have um, a lot of compassion and kindness and things that the world needs. And so I love that that is your answer. And I cannot wait to hear about your trip once you go. <laughs> thank you. Susan, thank you so much for being on the show today. You are just a ray of light. And I am so very happy that our paths have crossed. And thank you for thank sharing you. your story so openly today. I just love hearing about what you do. Thanks, Kimberly. It's been so great getting to know you. And yeah, I really enjoyed this. Thanks for inviting me.